Let's pray together. Lord God, we acknowledge that all truth is your truth. It all belongs to you. And as we heard in the song, all beauty is a reflection of your beauty in this world. Now, as we open your word, we ask that you'd show us wonderful things that are a reflection of your glory and beauty, that we might be more like you. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Jesus and politics. You ready? That sounds like a nervous laugh to me. So, you know, I, I realize that just even saying, if you've not been with us, we're in a series called With Jesus. What does it really mean when we're called to be his followers, just to live life with him? Not a nine to five thing, not a part time thing, but to live our lives with him. And that means all of our lives. And so we're talking our way through the aspects of our lives. And we're talking about Je what does Jesus have to say about politics? Which for some of you, I, just even saying it, I can tell, makes you a little uncomfortable and nervous. So in an effort to make everybody feel a little more at ease and relaxed, here's what I thought we'd do. You notice there's three different colored chairs. There's blue and there's gray and there's kind of dark gray. I'd like you to sit in the chair based on who you voted for in the last election. Okay, so, well, that's not funny. So let me, let's just start off with, if you voted for Donald Trump, go to the blue chairs. Ready? <laughs> you know, someone's moving. Do you see how weird it just got in the room right now? Why? It's such, a, it's such a difficult thing for us to even talk about. We, we want to separate those things. It makes us uncomfortable. The problem is that for many people, when we say political, I mean, is Jesus political? He means spiritual. He talks about a spiritual kingdom, and he has a lot of good things to say about who God is and how we can know God and morality, but is he political? Well, not in the narrow sense, but in the broad sense, he's incredibly political. We'll talk about that as we go. The problem for many of us is when we say political, what we mean is partisan. There's a huge difference. In our culture, people mean partisan. Partisan literally means feeling, showing, or deriving from st strong and sometimes blind adherence to a particular party. Political means the art or science of government concerned with guiding, governing, leading people. The Greek word from which we get political is the Greek word polis, which means of the people, of the city. What we do together as a community, that's political. According to a recent Gallup poll, 20 years ago, 1998, 14%, actually 13.8% of Americans believed the other party was not just wrong, but evil. 13.8%. Today, 20 years later, can you guess? 46%. It's more than tripled in 20 years. Those who think the other side of the aisle is not just wrong, but they're morally bankrupt and evil. America, we're told by social scientists, is more divided along partisan lines today than any other time since the Civil War. If you believe your social media feed or cable news channel, which you shouldn't, you'd be tempted to think that our country is divided right down the middle between the young and the woke and the angry white man. Right? Two camps. You know what I believe is actually true? Statistics are showing actually it's just true. That's the minorities. What, what we're mostly is what I would call the weary middle. The sick of it and exhausted people who don't know what to believe or where to turn to find truth. What does Jesus have to say about any of this? Is he political in this sense? Does he have anything to offer us in our contemporary climate? Actually, more than you think. Let's open, if you have your Bible, to Mark chapter 12. I'm just going to read a few verses. A little context here. This is in the section where Jesus is being repeatedly challenged or questioned or attacked by the authorities. It's getting close to the end of his earthly life. He's on his way to the cross. He's in Jerusalem in the temple courts when this takes place. Mark 12, verse 13. And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. 
Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is a fairly well-known passage. And it's often taught and interpreted that this is the separation of church and state. Caesar's and God's, and don't mix the two. And that we sort of live in this divided loyalties. We have loyalty to, to the government, of course, but ultimate loyalty to God, and we sort of have to walk the narrow tightrope. Or it's a division, really. Keep, you know, things of Caesar's or governments, that's, you know, economies and education and, uh, you know, social programs and all of that in its place. But the spiritual stuff, songs and the Word of God and hymns and church, that's fine over here. I want to suggest that this means exactly the opposite of the separation in that sense. First, let's look at this question. It's a curious question. It's actually a disingenuous question. We need to do a little work here to really understand what's going on. Let me give you a little historical background. We're told in the text that two groups approached Jesus to ask him a question. The Pharisees, I'm guessing most of you have heard about the Pharisees before. If you read any of the New Testament, you know this group is always challenging Jesus, and he doesn't always have nice things to say about the Pharisees. They were the primary group um, socially, morally, religiously, and politically in Israel at the time. They were serious about the moral law, the Mosaic law, and they deeply resented any interference by Rome into their political and religious life, and those things were intertwined to the Jewish worldview. So they didn't like Rome. They were the experts in the law. And you also have this group called the Herodians. Now, how have you heard of the word Sadducees before, Pharisees and Sadducees? The Sadducees would be opposite of the Pharisees on a theological spectrum. The Herodians would be opposite of them on a political spectrum. Here's why. The Herodians were those who supported the Herods. The Herod the Great, you remember him, who uh, was after killing all the infants under two years old, the firstborn little boys when Jesus was born. His sons, Her Philip Herod, Herod the Antipas, uh, he, it was a very corrupt, dysfunctional family, the Herodian dynasty. The Herodians were ones who supported the Herods. The Herods were propped up by Rome. So to be a Herodian was a de facto supporter of Rome. So the Pharisees who hated Roman interference and the Herodians who were basically supporting Roman rule would have nothing in common at all politically, except they didn't like Jesus. What would bring these two polar opposite camps together? Opposition to Jesus. Jesus both divides and unites. He is a dividing line in himself then and now. And so they come and they ask this question. Even the way they approach Jesus with this sort of, this buttering him up, right? We know that you teach truth and you don't care about the men's opinions. They don't care anything about that. They're not just asking about paying taxes in general. See, I always read this and thought, oh, they're trying to trap him on the horns, two horns of a dilemma. If he says, yes, pay taxes, then the Pharisees and their supporters wouldn't like him because he's, a, a, he's, a, he's compromising. If he says, no, don't pay them, then he's a, he's a radical and the Rome would be out to get him. That's true, but there's more going on here. They're speaking about a specific tax, what was called the imperial head tax in Rome. It was an annual tax for every Roman subject, not a citizen. If you're a Roman citizen, you didn't have to pay this tax. But if you were subjugated by Rome, meaning they owned you, dominated you, conquered your land, and, and you were their subject, you had to pay annually one denarius per person. A denarius was, uh, it was the average wage for an unskilled laborer in the first century. So it's not that for, uh, for a day's pay. A day's wage for unskilled laborer. So it's not that expensive. But it's the Jews hated this tax, and I'll explain why in a minute. When this tax was instituted, the imperial head tax, in 6 AD, there was a revolt led by a man named Judas the Galilean. You can read about this in Josephus' history of the Jews. Judas the Galilean led an armed revolt where he called on all Jews to refuse to pay this tax. He went into the temple, cleansed the temple with an armed band, threw out all the pagans, all the Romans, out of the temple courts, and he declared, we only have one king, and it's God, not Caesar. Of course, Rome put that revolt down. This all took place 25 years before this altercation we're reading about in Mark 12. So when they come to Jesus and say, is it right to pay the tax? They're talking about this. They're saying, are you a revolutionary, Jesus? Are you a radical? Jesus has already cleansed the temple, remember? Not with a sword, but with a whip. 
turning over the, temp, the money changers' tables. He's been talking about the kingdom of God, saying the kingdom of God is here. What's left? The tax question. They're trying to get him to declare one side or the other. Where are you on this question, Jesus? Now, if Jesus says, no, don't pay, he aligns himself with the radical armed resistance and becomes the enemy of Rome. If he says, yes, pay, be good citizens, then he loses all credibility with the people who are oppressed. We tend to, in our culture to separate what we think of as God's kingdom, the inner spiritual peace and sense of God's love for you from regular life, you know, living in a world where there's real things going on. But that's a product of the Enlightenment and a fairly recent development. For most cultures throughout history, your religion, your faith, had everything to do with the rest of your life. They weren't separated. So when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God and quotes from Isaiah and says, the, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor, liberty to the captives, the day of the Lord is here. He's talking about real poverty, real injustice, real people, not just inner peace, but real peace in a world that's broken and full of strife and conflict. If Jesus had just simply said, be good citizens, pay your taxes, and you'll have inner peace with me, and, you know, just wait it out. People would have walked away. What offer is that? They're trying to get Jesus to pick a side, you see. Notice how they even phrase it. They say, is it right to pay taxes or not? Should we or shouldn't we? They, re they repeat it a couple of times. But I, one of the things for you and me to see is... Jesus will, will not give a simplistic answer here. He will not be backed into a political corner where he has to choose a side. And neither should we. And we shouldn't do it to him. If Jesus, I think we should all be very, very careful of thinking we know the party or the position or the voting platform of Jesus. When politicians in our culture are asked tough questions, how do they respond? When you see a politician in a debate or in an interview and they get asked a really tough question, what do they do? They're always straightforward and honest, aren't they? They always go right at the issue and just answer it straightforwardly. No, they don't, do they? They don't answer it at all. They dance around it, they change the subject, they deflect, they give the, the, their stump speech, they, and no matter how hard the interviewer tries to get them back on the subject, they won't do it. And if you listen to that, if you pay attention, you get irritated, don't you? Like, he didn't even answer the question. Jesus... When he answers, are the people irritated and mad? No, they marvel, they're amazed, and they walk away. So he's not giving the kind of non-answer that some of our politicians give. Because Jesus is not seeking your vote. He's not trying to win your allegiance by promising you things on the worldly system. Let's look at his revolutionary response. They're asking him, are you revolutionary? And his answer is revolutionary, but not the way anyone thinks. He doesn't dodge the question. He doesn't avoid the issue. His answer is totally off the map, though. It's not what anyone expected. Let me look, look at verse 15 and 16 again of the passage. But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought him one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. They want to know whose side are you on, Jesus. And his refusal to be politically pigeonholed tells us that we should also be very careful of that. One of the things I think in our, in our two-party system in America that's so messed up is sort of this like, um, it's, it's this sort of all-in ethics. You can't work with the other side of whatever issue or whatever party because you have to buy the whole thing unless you agree on every position. But as Christians... We would all have to say we, we should be radically caring about the poor. We should be protecting the vulnerable, including those that are living, those that are at our borders, those that are unborn, all of the vulnerable. We should be for caring about those who are incarcerated. I'm just going through a gospel list here, not a political list. We should be conservative, traditional in our sexual ethic and our view of marriage. Go right down the list. What one party contains all these things? We should be for racial justice. 
They don't. But the problem is we feel like we have to align on one side or the other. Jesus won't do it, so let's not do it to him. He asked him to bring them a denarius. This is where he's just so, I mean, among, as well as being the son of God, he's just really cool and smart. <laughs> The coin for the imperial head tax. Here's a picture. We have, these are in museums. We have uh, originals from these. This is Tiberius Caesar's denarius. He asked the question, whose image and whose inscription is on it? That's the, by the way, in Latin, what it says on both sides of the coin is Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus Pontificus Maximus. What that translates to is Caesar, Tiberius, king, son of God, high priest. That's literally what it says on the coin. Caesar, king, son of God, son of the divine Augustus, who claimed to be God, Caesar Augustus, and Pontificus Maximus, high priest. This is why the Jews hated this tax. Because of whose image and inscription that is. Keep that up there, by the way. Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Okay, what's Caesar's? What's his? Well, he's got his face on it. It's literally his money minted out of his silver. So give it to him. Give it back to him. It is literally his money. Interesting, in Jesus' answer, he changes the verb in Greek. When they come to him and they ask him this question, they ask him, is it right to, and they use the word duanai, which means pay to give tribute, to present tribute to Caesar. And Jesus answers with a different verb the, in, in Aramaic translated Greek. It's the word apodidomi. It literally means to pay back what you owe. So they say, is it right to give tribute to Caesar? And Jesus says, give him what you owe him. What do you owe him? Well, you owe Caesar or the government, whatever it is, has their image on it. Pay what you owe to Caesar. Pay what you owe to God. No, by the way, this is an interesting note. Secular and Christian scholars indicate that this statement of Jesus, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's, is the first hint of what we would call limited government in human history. Prior to this, all governments, rulers, nations, you know, they, they claim divine authority over all of your life. Jesus says, not so. Not so. You owe something to the government, but not everything. And knowing the difference is the whole key. So give back to Caesar his money, but you must not give him your worship. You must not give him your ultimate allegiance. You must not give him your heart. Why? Because it doesn't have his name on it. It doesn't have his image on it. This is brilliant and it's revolutionary, but not in the way anyone saw coming. The kingdom will come. The king will reign, but not through armed resistance, neither through political acquiescence. So we don't get to just withdraw and hide away and say it's all stupid and I don't believe any of it. That's my temptation, by the way. I put on my Facebook profile, political views, increasingly cynical, right? <laughs> we don't get to just disengage. Neither do, should we sell our soul to one platform or position or party. I think a lot of our issue today is we're giving to Caesar what belongs to God. We're getting it wrong. I've been reading this book by a guy named Benjamin Sass. He's a, a senator from Nebraska, and he's got this section in there, in his book, where his premise is that our problem is not political divide. Our problem is deeper. He says those things in our lives which are supposed to give us meaning, family, friends, meaningful work, worship, are crumbling in our society. And so we're looking for political tribalism to give us things politics aren't supposed to give us. This brings us to a higher hope. What, what is Jesus really calling us to? What's he really saying to us? You know, even the limited power of the state is a derivative power. You remember in John 19 when Jesus has this encounter with Pilate, the Roman ruler in, in Israel and Jerusalem at the time before his crucifixion? Do you remember this scene? And Pilate can't get Jesus, he can't get him to, to, you know, just say something that will give him a chance to get him off the hook. And Pilate says in a moment of frustration, don't you realize I have the power of life and death over you? Remember this? What does Jesus say? He says, you would have no 
authority and power over me if it were not given to you from above. Every earthly authority is a derivative authority. So even in our limited obedience to an earthly authority, it's, we do that because we know ultimately God is in charge. Let me read to you what the apostle, it won't be on the screen, I'm just going to read to you what the apostle Paul says in Romans 13. This is the classic passage on how we're to relate to earthly authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment, for rulers are not a terror to, to good conduct, but to bad. Would you, you, would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you'll receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for... He does not bear the sword in vain. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Now, I know, I, even when I read it, what's going on in my head is, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. God can use and has used and will use even those authorities that we think this person can't possibly from, be from God. He used Pilate. He used Herod. All I'm saying here is that Jesus says, pay what you owe to Caesar and to God. And don't mix those two. Give to Caesar. What do we give to Caesar? Caesar. What do we give to Caesar? Let's look at verse 17, Mark 12, verse 17 again. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, and they marveled at him. Okay, let's talk about that. Give to Caesar. What do you owe? I would say two things, prayer and participation. As a follower of Jesus in the world, you owe the government... That you're, that you're under your prayer. They're not asking for it all the time. But you should, if you're not on your knees for our country, for our leaders, you should be. It's our call. Pray. Pray for God's will. Pray for people that are corrupt, to have their hearts broken and repentant, or be removed. It doesn't just mean pray to have God smite the ones you don't like. Right? It means pray for all of them. Pray for their hearts. Pray for wisdom and clarity. It's, I, I can't imagine the pressure of leading at that level in our country. Be on your knees for them. Pray for them. And participate. Vote. Not just voting pay taxes, but at least that. But get involved. If it's your calling to run for office, run for office. If you feel passionate about a cause that is right out of the gospel and the heart of God, get involved. Be active for it. But always remember whose inscription is on your heart and whose image is on your life. That's crucial. Never forget whose image you bear. So let's talk about giving to God. What is God? What it belongs to God. When Jesus uses that coin, it's so brilliant. He says, whose inscription? Whose image? Caesar's. Every Jew there would have known what he's doing. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them in his image. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know, you must know, you're made in his image, you bear his image, his word is inscribed on your heart. Don't give that to Caesar. Don't attach your ultimate allegiance to a person or a party or a platform because you're doing the opposite of what Jesus says to do. Give your worship and your whole life to God. Give your prayer and participation to the government. We're getting this backwards, friends, aren't we? We're living in a culture where people are flipping this around, even Christians. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, in view of God's mercy, brothers and sisters, offer yourselves as living sacrificing to God, holy and pleasing. This is your spiritual act of worship. What do you owe Caesar? 
What do you owe the government? Your prayer, your obedience, your faithfulness, your participation? Yes. What do you owe to God? Your whole self. Your whole life. And this is why. Like, if we were just to say, okay, we could all agree that as a Christ follower, and I'm, you can respond to this, you won't, but you could. As a Christ follower in the world, would you all agree that we should care about the poor? Let's just start with that, right? If anybody's doing this, we need to talk later, right? No, we don't have to. We should all care deeply about the poor in our culture. We should all want and pray for a society in which the poor are not marginalized and oppressed, but they're cared for, they're provided for, and they have opportunity. Would we all agree? Show of hands if you agree. Okay, I got you to do something. Good. All right. The, the, the conservative view, and I'm going to summarize this, would be this. Well, the best way to do that is for a robust free market economy where all boats rise. People have a, a more opportunity to raise themselves out of poverty. Those who are growing wealthy are incentivized to be generous to more opportunities for people to, to grow. And, and it, it's not perfect, but that's the best way. The liberal view would be like, you know, really can't trust people to do the right thing. History should tell us that. And so we, a just society is one in which the government ensures that the poor are cared for, and that has to be paid for. And we should all pay to make sure that that happens into that system. You could be a Christ follower and legitimately have either view. You can. Some of you are going, I don't like where this is going, right? <laughs> Here's what's happening in our culture, though. Here's what's happening in our culture. We're not told this. We're told they don't care about the poor. This is my right hand, it's your left, but just pretend, right? The right. They don't care about the poor. They care about keeping the rich richer and exploiting the poor for the one percenters. And we're told they don't care about the poor. They use the poor for their agenda. They just want to control everything with, through the government and redistribute all your wealth and take away all your money. Now, I know there are nutcases on both sides, but I'm saying you can follow Jesus and disagree about this. Here's what I'm trying to say is, it happens to me too. Don't let the rhetoric in our culture divide your mind and heart. Jesus says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And it's not your heart. And it's not your ultimate allegiance. You give that to God. Only to God. Because you bear his image. You know, one of the ironies of this story is that when they come to Jesus and they say, they ask the question, he goes, give me a denarius. Did you notice that? What does that mean? It means he didn't have one. What king doesn't have a coin? He's penniless. And here's the crazy irony. It means they did have one. Pharisees who hate Roman interference have the denarius with Caesar's inscription on it, and Jesus does it. I just find that hilarious, Right? Jesus is the king without a coin. Tiberius is the king with all the coins, literally. But whose king is still, which king is still reigning? Whose kingdom is still growing? Rome and Tiberius are long gone, friends. But the kingdom of God will never end. This is a different kind of king we serve. It's unlike anything. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he who was rich became poor. Why? So that in him you might become rich. He who was strong became weak. Why? So that you who are weak and broken might be strong in him. The king who suffered and died so that you might live. In a famous address at the Urbana Conference in 1970, a African-American evangelist named Tom Skinner, some of you might know that name, gave a speech that still echoes today. People listen to it. And, and he basically compared Jesus and Barabbas. Remember Barabbas? Both of them under arrest under Pilate. And he's got to release one of them. And the people call for Barabbas. His point is, there's no way Rome releases Barabbas if they thought Barabbas was a bigger threat than Jesus. They wouldn't do it. Why do they do it? Because you can always kill Barabbas. You can always stop a Barabbas. He's going to go get his armed band. You just march in with legions. You just roll the tanks in the neighborhood. You, you know, you take away his funding. You assassinate him. You can always put down an armed resistance. But how do you stop Jesus? You kill him? That doesn't end his kingdom. It starts it. It starts it. That's our ultimate allegiance, friends. Of all people, we should be the most open to new ideas and different perspectives and the least judgmental and the least stressed out and worried about it. The least angry about it. Because we know ultimately who's in charge. Our hope is not in who's in the White House. Our hope is not who's in the Supreme Court. Our hope is not in the midterm elections. 
Vote, participate, pray. That's not your hope. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but don't give him your heart. That belongs to God. Let's pray. Father, this is, we admit this is easy to say and it's hard to do in our culture. But God, I, I also see that our world needs more of us who are getting this right, who are surrendering our whole lives to you, and then are free to participate and pray in a society that's torn apart. Thank you that we bear your image. Help us by your spirit to give to you what we owe you, and that's our whole lives, because you've given us everything. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.